Okay, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, I am Dr. Jamie Coulter. I am an associate professor in the Department of Counseling and Behavioral Health, and I am a co-PI on the Project CREST grant. Project CREST, as you all know, stands for Certified Rehabilitation Counselors and Educators Supporting Transition Success, and it is a U.S. Department of Education training grant. CREST webinars, like this one, are designed to enrich the education of students who are learning to support blind and visually impaired students as they transition from secondary education settings, hopefully resulting in improved career outcomes and quality of life. So I'm very happy to introduce this evening's webinar and speaker. Dr. Kim Mathos will be giving a talk titled Mental Health Considerations When Working with Children Who Are Blind. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, as you heard, this is being recorded. Um, please feel free, we are a small group, uh, so please feel free to participate however you feel comfortable. If you just wanna unmute yourself and shout out, um, that is fine. If you wanna put something in the chat, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, we're a small group, so we can be a little bit more informal. And now I will introduce our speaker. So Dr. Kimberly Mathos specializes in psychiatry and is certified in psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. She practices here at the University of Pittsburgh um, and is affiliated with UPMC Presbyterian. She completed her fellowship and residency at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. She enjoys teaching, clinical care, and community participation projects. And speaking of community participation projects and um, similar projects, uh, just on Friday, a few days ago, she organized a really exceptional conference on disability awareness, promoting advocacy and competency in behavioral and physical health care. Um, and I was really happy to be able to attend that. There was a lot of learning going on and a lot of passion from the speakers and attendees. So uh, keep your eyes open for future projects in that vein. So we're all looking forward to hearing more about your expertise in supporting the mental health of children who are blind. So with um, that, I will turn it over to you, Kim. Okay. Let me make sure I have your slides up here. Okay, good, I have the slides up. And I really appreciate, we have collaborated for a number of years on some various things and students sometimes come across the street to rotate with us for internships and the 300 hours as well. And we all, it's always a wonderful, great group of folks. So we've enjoyed the collaboration with the, you all as well, uh, you know, in the Department of Psychiatry. So um, I have a clinical interest in working for the past like 30 something years, a long time. I started working with individuals who had uh, deaf, who were deaf, who had um, were deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. And then it sort of morphed into also working with people who were blind and particularly so during COVID because during COVID so few resources existed. There wasn't transportation for people. There was a lot of social isolation, suicide attempts in the blind community and lots of terrible outcomes. And so um, I kind of got pulled into that a little bit more than I had been, but I have consulted at the School for the Blind Children for about 10 years. I don't currently, but um, now I do a lot of work at Prezi Ridge School for the Deaf at University of Pittsburgh. And I do a lot of um, uh, telehealth actually in consultation about deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing people. So that's a little bit about me. And um, since it's a small group, and Dr. Colzer said it's kind of a mixed group as far as your background, I was wondering if you could kind of tell me a little bit about where you see yourselves being five years from now so we could sort of tailor what we talk about a little bit. Um, if that's okay. And across my screen would be, I think, Zach. Sure. Hello, I'm Zach. Um, I'm studying um, the uh, vision program right now, um, the Masters of Education, and then the certificate to be um, a teacher for the visually impaired. Currently, I actually work at the University of Pittsburgh as an academic advisor, so I'll do that until I complete the program at least. Um, where I hope to see myself is uh, supporting, I really love uh, college age individuals. I think that I'll be probably in the public school system most likely, um, but really like working in higher ed would be awesome. I think that'll be kind of a great way to tie in what I love already. Yeah, it is so true. One thing leads you to another in life. Uh, Catherine's next on my screen, Catherine Solder. Yeah, hi, I also go by Kat. 
Um, I am part of the Masters of Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. Um, currently in my internship at um, Heimdry Andrews Center uh, with a Cognitive Skills Enhancement Program. And I guess in five years, um, my hope is to uh, get certified as a rehabilitation counselor and then also pursue uh, licensure as a counselor in PA. Um, and in terms of population, I'm really interested in adolescents and transition to, transition age youth, um, and especially working in um, a setting where uh, the population both has mental health and um, uh, disability representation and, and kind of issues of focus. Um, yeah. That sounds awesome. Holly? Hi, my name is Polly Short, and I am also in the Vision Program, the Masters of Education and TVI certification. I currently work full-time at an intermediate unit as an orientation mobility specialist, so I am very much already in the field of working with students with visual impairments. In five years, I still want to be working for an IU. I definitely prefer working with school-age students. Um, I just want to have more of a mixed caseload, so I'm doing TVI and some orientation mobility. I also might want to do um, go into the birth to three early intervention, and there is a need in my um, county, so that's kind of where I'm leaning for right now. But I think that, as I'm sure all of us could agree, that it could change a lot in the next five years of where I'll end up. Yeah. What county are you from? I'm in um, Delaware County. That's near Philly, right? Yes, it's in between Philly and Delaware. Lucy? Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, right now I'm a paraprofessional for a blind um, elementary age student. Um, I'm in the dual program, so I'll have my TVI and L&M certification. And I hope to work in an IU somewhere with elementary age, high school age kids. When you say paraprofessional, does that mean you're an intervener or some other role? I'm just a one-on-one -on -one aid for a student. Okay. Um, next is Victoria. Hi, I'm also in the clinical mental health counseling program. I currently predominantly work with transition age students uh, with cognitive and physical disabilities both for our Cognitive Skills Enhancement Program with CAT and as a assistive technology specialist with the Center for Assistive Technology at the HCAC. And I eventually want to work with uh, students that are blind and visually impaired um, more on like the assistive technology side and also work with transition age students more as like a professor or an educator eventually, but Carly? Hi, I'm Carly. Um, I am in the clinical mental health counseling program. Um, I'm currently doing my internship at a residential treatment facility, working with kids and adolescents who have struggled with trauma, um, behavioral challenges, things like that. Um, in five years, I would um, like to pers pursue my license um, and also get certified. I'm not sure if I want to take the CRC or the NCE yet, but that's still like kind of up in the air for me. Very awesome. Sarah? Hello, I'm Sarah. Um, and I currently also work for an intermediate unit. I work for the Lancaster Lebanon intermediate unit. Um, and I am a material specialist, so I uh, produce Braille materials and other adapted materials for blind and visually impaired students throughout the Lancaster and Lebanon counties. Um, and I'm in the program to get my TVI certification and Master's of Education. Um, and I anticipate that I might continue to work for the Lancaster Lebanon IU13 um, as, a, as a TVI. Um, and I just really look forward to fostering self-determination skills um, and helping students to realize their potentials. Um, I'm also interested in, in vision rehab, if, if potentially something would open in that field someday. Um, I'm open to wherever the paths lead at this point, but um, I think that covers it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes. You guys are all rocking. Um, so a word to the people that are going to be mental health counselors, 
in the world of mental health currently, you somebody talked about the integration of re, like uh, rehabilitation and mental health. Well, like at Western Psych, there's silos. So there's like a silo for depression, a silo for psychosis. So the idea of you guys wanting to do like rehabilitation counseling together with mental health is a new phenomena in the world of like this whole mental health counseling. That's not how in the past people have historically always been trained, nor do all you guys who are in mental health counseling often have the opportunity to interface with blind kids or with deaf kids or special needs kids. So like, if you're really interested in that, make sure you spend some time in pockets where there's people that meet that description, you know, to work with when you do your internship and your 300 hours as well. Um, and it's just thrilling that you guys want to do this kind of crossover thing. It just, uh, you know, just uh, makes my heart feel good because there isn't enough of you guys to in the world, you know. So um, without moving on here, we're going to talk a little bit about this is kind of our outline for the day. You guys who probably have been studying vision for a long time know a lot more about some of these etiologies, but I think even people in the world of mental health counseling need to know a little bit about like risk factors that happen when a person has this uh, etiology of blindness or that, or if they have this syndrome or that, there are certain things that go hand in hand with syndromes. Like for example, like charge syndrome, you know, they might have cardiac issues. They might have, of course, vision issues. They might have general urine issues. They might have autism related issues. Um, so, you know, knowing a little bit about those particular syndromes, if you're in mental health counseling and you happen to work with blind kids, that's an important thing because uh, that might correlate with some things that you might see before you clinically. We'll talk a little bit about, I loved all the people that were going into early intervention and, you know, the transitions in life. And so I kind of like to focus on recovery and strengths-based related mental health. Like when these kids are first diagnosed or when you work with them in schools to build skills that they don't have depression later or that they can be self-advocates in the healthcare setting or, you know, building resilience is the name of the game so that there isn't suffering. And also another take home point, what I shall reiterate at the end too, but another take home point is all the while that you're working with children who are blind, you want to ask them about their emotions, ask them how they're coping, you know, who their peer group is. So I'm going to say that numerous times through the talk so that you diminish any kind of stigma about having depression or anxiety and you increase conversation about actually how people were feeling by those sort of conversations. I think you guys do that in your generation way more than we do. I'm 60. We used to have a lot more stigma about mental health, you know, and I don't think that's as much of an issue as it is. But sometimes when you're working with kids with special needs in general, their parents can't wrap their head or the teacher can't wrap their head around. Maybe they have depression, too. And they attribute a lot of stuff to the blindness, you know, more so than is true, you know, or maybe the blindness led them to have this symptom or that, you know. And so you want to think comprehensively when you're working with kids. And we'll get into that. We'll talk a little bit about um, let's see who was the AT person. Um, Somebody along the way was really down on the AT stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about assistive technology and the role that assistive technology has in preventing people from feeling isolated and scared and so forth too. So some of the things that you guys are doing, orientation and mobility empowers people, makes them feel more proud or able to get around in their environment. So that social isolation is diminished when you make people more able to get around. COVID really put a humdinger in, you know, a wrench in people's ability to get around and still like there's not SSPs for deaf blind people. And there was a, like not as many interveners in the school settings, you know, and not a, as many personal care aides um, during COVID. And so it was a terrible time for people who were blind or who required, you know, independent one-on-one um, -on -one supports. So, and then we'll end with, um, if a person has, we'll talk a little bit about depression and anxiety and autism and ADD and intellectual disabilities some. And you don't have to be an expert in all these things, just like I'm certainly not an expert in blindness, 
But if you collaborate with people who you're comfortable with and you find a list of resources of people in your area, or, or for those of you who become counselors, you partner with somebody who knows more than you do about vision, then that's how sort of that collaborative effort is how we meet the needs of blind individuals who need our help more. So I think Dr. Colzer was saying, you guys have talked a lot about some of the etiologies of blindness, um, CVI, cataracts, vitamin A deficiency in um, some uh, countries. Did I understand you guys have had conversations about that, right? Yeah. Think about some of the things, those of you who are mental health counselors, about some of those infectious diseases that lead to blindness as well. Um, I work sometimes in Mercer County in the Amish community and rubella is still a thing there and rubella makes kids blind and deaf. Um, and also coincidentally, it makes a higher risk of development of psychosis and sometimes learning disabilities and autism. So some of those torch infections and meningitis too um, might lead to other mental health sequelae, um, ADD, learning disabilities and so forth. So keep a high index of suspicion when you're working with a child and that's the etiology. So with all things that are stressors, it's important to kind of get a handle when you're dealing with the child who's an adolescent or with the parent to know a little bit about how the blindness happened to, to get a feel for the coping strategies and the supports that exist for a person. Like, was the person born with this particular um, blindness? Was it congenital? Were they premature and the mom is glad they're alive and yet now there's this new stressor? Um, did it happen at the hands of someone like as if it's an accident or a trauma or at the hands of a parent themselves? Is like this a child who's in the foster system or what exactly is the etiology of the blindness? Um, is it genetic, like maybe the parent or somebody else in the family has Usher syndrome or some other etiology of the blindness? And that means a lot for a parent too, like maybe there's some guilt or maybe there's some, you know, questioning or, you know, um, ED, all these issues have a lot to do with how people cope with things. We well, want to know too a little bit about um, what level of vision the person has or what usable vision, particularly as you teach O&M. You want to know sort of what the person's visual fields are, where they'll be safe, where they need an aid, would they benefit from a cane? You know, what sort of, um, what do that, what's, what, what's in their visual field? How much can they use? Or is it good for them to have this particular assistive technology or that? You wanna also sort of gather an opinion from the parents about the person's independent living skills, like what they can do for themselves. So you have a little bit of an understanding of their intellectual level and their developmental level compared to other same age peers. You don't have to be an expert in that either, but you wanna sort of have in your mind, how does this child compare to other people of their same age in regards to social skill development, intellectual development, independent living skills, pride, um, peer relations, you know, you don't want to explain everything away because of the blindness. We need to approach these issues that we see before us and intervene early. Also, uh, uh, I don't know what Delaware County is like. I live myself in Westmoreland County, but I work in Allegheny County. And um, I would, if I had a choice, get mental health services in Allegheny County compared to Westmoreland County, probably, because there's more resources, more people in training, more um, people who collaborate more. In Westmoreland, you can find good providers, but it's not a hub or a hotbed of intervention services for blind individuals or for counselors either, for that matter. I don't know what it's like in some of the counties where you guys are from, but it's important that you sort of have in your mind who's good, even if they're not expert per se, who is competent enough to deal with a person who's blind in your vicinity. And then when um, you know these things when you're out in the field, whether you're a transition age uh, counselor or whatever, it's important maybe to put together a resource directory of different services or different um, 
you know, where do you go for assistive technology or who can you contact when it's time to transition to college, you know, that sort of thing. So through childhood, um, and I wanna get your opinion on different things in a minute, but these are some of the hurdles like when you're talking about a two or three, or when, right when the child is born, in fact, one of the biggest hurdles is early intervention when a, a child is born blind. There's many things that don't go as planned. The parent doesn't get some of the feedback. The child doesn't get some of the mom's social cues. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So attachment is a big potential hurdle for people that affects brain development, that affects how the parent-child relationship is gonna be forever. Um, when a child learns to walk and get around, that is important in regards to that child feeling confident in themselves or autonomous in their environment. And there's new challenges when the, when the person becomes a teenager. How comfortable is the parent in letting them go, you know, letting them go with other kids out into the community or are they going to let them go away to college or are they never going to let that child leave their site? You know, all those kind of issues are really important and important to teach the self-advocacy, I think, Sarah, you were saying. And then another thing as you move into your 20s is who you're going to marry, who you're going to be with, who's who, you know, what sort of goals, what sort of life uh, desire do you have? Are you going to be a parent? That sort of thing. And I work with a couple people who are themselves blind parents and um, very happy with being with parenthood. And I remember one blind guy who's maybe in his late 20s or something was talking to me about sort of how scared he, he, he felt really good about the infant thing. He could deal with that because the kid was right there in his arms. But when the kid wanted to start to walk away when he was two and three, he felt totally incompetent and totally afraid to take him to the playground, you know, and really relied on other people more. And he didn't like that at all and was trying to think, you know, with his wife together about how to deal with that particular problem. Is there a fence playground or can I go with somebody else or, you know, all these things that you don't necessarily think about if you're sighted. Okay, so anybody, we're gonna move on to social and emotional here. So let's talk about attachment. Who was gonna do early intervention? Uh, was that Holly? Yes. So what are some of the things that you wanna think about when a kid, um, is blind and you're an early intervention provider. So I know from experience from working with some, the TVI who currently works for inter early intervention, uh, a lot of it is working with the parents because you're not, well, sometimes they're at like preschools, but most of the time you're going to their homes to provide services. So you have a much closer relationship with the parents. And I think that can be tricky to kind of navigate all those complex feelings while the parents are, you know, right there. And some of them, I'm sure, are hovering, you know, their student hasn't really ever left them. So it might be, you know, a very emotional time for parents to have these students starting those services. And you want to think about the parents' mental health in addition to the child's, you know, and sometimes you know, knowing when to refer a parent for help in a nice way, you know, just talking about how they're emotionally dealing with things, connecting them to some parents' supports. It's invaluable. And, you know, when I meet people sometimes that are 18, they remember their early intervention. They remember some of the exact conversations that people have told them, you know, that, that made them feel okay with pursuing a referral or not, you know. So, you know, it's monumentous, the work that you do when you do early intervention. Um, trying to advance that slide, Dr. Pulitzer. Oh, there we go. So um, what about eye gaze, Holly, while you're on the EI track? So I, I don't know too much about this yet, because even though I want to go into EI, I'm not currently working with students. But I know a lot of times um, parents might not realize that you know it's not that their child doesn't love them it's just that they're not able to make you know make that eye connection um 
And so I think, you know, making sure to be mindful of that with the parents and explaining, you know, it's not that your students doesn't, not that your child doesn't love you. It's not that, you know, the child wants to make a connection with you. It's not that it isn't, you know, it doesn't already have that attachment to you as a parent. It's just, they might not be able to make that eye gaze because they aren't able to see your eyes to, you know, make that connection. Yeah. So I don't know also if any of you are parents, you know, Dr. Coulter and I are parents with our kids are older, but you remember as a parent, the minute your child responds to you socially, like the minute they smile, you remember it. Like it just, the world could go to hell in a handbasket, but you remember your child loves you and you're, you're okay with the world, you know? And it's the same feeling for the child, you know, that they are secure and that, you know, like you meet kids who are from orphanage from other places and they didn't have that experience or they didn't have that reassurance. So if you work in earlier intervention, it's really important to teach other reassuring kind of strategies. And like you said, Holly, about teaching the parents like that, that it's not all about the eye gaze. Now you can also, you know, tell your child, you love them, have them hold your face so that they feel your smile or, you know, rub them and, you know, tickle them if you want the smile back, you know, and like that kind of education. So the parent feels competent that they can do this and they understand, you know, and that builds a foundation of, of, of power with the parent too, in, in that parent child dynamic. Um, so, um, also another thing in early intervention is, uh, I don't know, um, honestly, I'm not sure where this would happen because now it's been mostly people going to the homes, like you say, but there's like sometimes little forums where stories are read together. I know they do that for hard of hearing kids at the school for the deaf. And I think they did it at the school for the blind too, so that parents get to meet other parents. You know, COVID kind of messed all those things up, but you know, it's the it's important that parents understand. I think um, I don't know if there's an equivalent to Hands and Voices, the program for hard of hearing um, families that are newly diagnosed. But the bottom line is, you want parents to sort of reach out to other parents, however you can do that in your area, um, and and you know, think about like they need support, like somebody was saying and and that child also needs to have a peer group as well another really important next thing that you think about when you're thinking about child development um is is communication and um let's see who was a communication person somebody did braille let's see Was that Sarah? Yep, I do real. Okay, so what does communication mean for people as far as their mental health? Um, I think, well, especially for 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 blind people who um, don't read print, um, and they're you know if their parents do, um, there's that. That barrier that could be challenging. Um, so I think it's important for parents to, you know, um, be be taught and have a, a desire to to learn with their student um, to be able to communicate in that way. Um, verbal communication, I guess, wouldn't be as challenging, um, but definitely um, just being able to to learn together, um, you know, what a student is learning in school, the parent um, should be able to, to work with the student in the mediums that, that they're needing um, to be able to learn. Um, and if they can't, that might be uh, challenging for, for both the student and the parent. So it's empowering, right? For the kids to learn about their world, you know, like knowledge is power and language is power. You were saying, yeah. And so sometimes people are hard of hearing too, or deaf also, that sort of thing. Sometimes they have intellectual disabilities or autism as well. So an important thing as an early intervention person or as the Braille teacher or, you know, early intervention is to recognize what communication, if your blind child reads Braille and can hear, you know, you got that. You can put that in the IEP and sort of perpetuate those. But if that child has like ushers and they're going to lose 
more vision or they're going to lose their hearing, what do you got to think of next in regards to communication, you know? So communication helps people connect with the world. It also helps people know what's going to happen next. Like the parent can then tell the child, okay, we're going to Graham's tomorrow. Um, so the kid doesn't have a temper tantrum because they want to stay and watch Dora, you know? So, you know, like as a parent, it's important to explain to the child things that are coming next. And if you don't have a language to do that, that's not good either, you know? So like you said, sort of like making sure the parent knows what what the kid can understand and rolling with what kind of communication strategy um, seems to fit the child. Anybody else have any um, comments on that? Um, I might just add to that. Um, I mean, I think assistive technology is really beneficial for that. And lot, there are lots of different yeah. devices and things. And um, you would think that that a parent would know their child best and and um, be able to com to communicate with their child best. That might not not always be the case. Um, I worked as a one on one with two different students before I started this job, um, and I was really interested in learning about the ways that they communicated. Um, and because I worked with them so closely, I could, for the most part, understand them and communicate with them. Um, and other people didn't necessarily know how to because they were not verbal. Um, and uh, that just really interests me that there are ways to communicate even if they're not verbal um, or whatnot. But I think there are devices and technologies that are beneficial in supporting that as well. I have a feeling you know lots you want to add about that. Other ways to communicate even if they're not verbal. Can you comment on that some more? Um, well, the one student that I had had a, a speech device um, that she would use to communicate. It was a Dynavox. Um, and uh, she had some physical challenges where she couldn't always necessarily choose, you know, the things that she wanted to say using that. Um, uh, but that that was beneficial. And also just just knowing, you know, even though she didn't have a lot of verbal language, um, she was still able to answer questions and communicate, even though it wasn't necessarily always very audible or very clear. And even to say to a parent, just to add to what you just said so eloquently, even just to support the parent in saying there's other ways to communicate, like behavior and proximity and gestures. And, you know, it's it's you're not a failing parent just because your child doesn't talk. You know, you, you, we have to expand on what, what works so that your child doesn't, you know, exhort, have temper tantrums all the time and that you can be a better parent by understanding what your child needs. You know, that whole dynamic of, of empowering them at every step of the way, you know, the child and the parent on that, you know. So um, I'm gonna ta talk a couple examples of my buddy, Jake here, who's one of my students and one of my favorite students. So um, it's not really his name, but um, Jake has Usher syndrome and he has pretty significant visual impairment and he's hard of hearing and he probably will become deaf pretty soon. Um, but he, he um, doesn't, uh, he, he wants to be involved, but sometimes you can't understand what he's saying. You know, he, English is his first language but he doesn't always articulate things because of the level of his hearing loss. You don't always know what he's saying. And his visual fields are such that sometimes he's not, he makes erroneous mistakes because of, um, because of not seeing so well. So sometimes you, you know, we look at each other, the professionals in the room, like, what the heck did he say? You know, and we'll ask them rather than saying, what the heck did you say? We'll say, show us on the smart board. So we understand better, or can you draw a picture or, you know, that kind of thing that doesn't deflate his self-esteem, but more along the lines of teaching him there's other strategies if, if his first communication modality isn't a winner. Um, so I'll have another Jake story later too. So this next learning style difference is you guys who are teachers um, probably can expound on this more. But you know, some kids, um, somebody wanna jump in here who's a teacher, who's going into the teaching fields, but even like some people who are blind do best learning through their ears still. Some people 
tend to use the residual vision skill. And some kids need like motoric input or physical proximity to people. Like there's all kind of learning just as there's so many different strategies to communicate. There's also so many different strategies about learning. And so as a teacher and also as a counselor, you wanna be sure that, you know, if someone wants someone in their proximity, then you try to make that happen with an intervener. But if somebody is stressed by somebody in their close proximity, then let's try another avenue. You know, so there's all these ways and you guys are the same, you know, like some people like I have to have a pen in my hand with a highlighter or I don't remember squat, you know. Um, we all have our little weird idiosyncrasies in how we learn and it's, it's the same for blind kids too. And I don't know if anybody who's a teacher wants to talk about that for a minute. You guys know more about that than I do. But the bottom line is you want to do what everybody's comfortable with, not force one strategy. You know, that's frustrating for the child, you know, and going to promote them to become anxious, you know, and not good. Next, I want to talk about assistive technology. And um, assistive technology is something that can change over time. Like what works for a young child might not be what you know, they um, end up doing when they're 18, you know, that can change over time. So why would assistive technology correlate with mental health? Um, would that be cat? I am, um, I have some assistive technology knowledge, but um, I definitely have thoughts. Um, I would say, uh, you know, just in order to have assistive technology, that's a huge, like you've mentioned, um, huge empowerment for um, students and clients that um, assistive technology becomes an extension of them and, and allows them to um, do and communicate things that they um, would otherwise have great difficulty with. Um, so I think just in order to um, ha be, have assistive technology as part of like their kind of tool belt of, of skills is really important. And then also um, I could see it playing into um, mental health if assistive technology um, fails or if there's issues or if other people do not know how to respect or understand their assistive technology, um, that that becomes a... Um, a uh, could become something that's um, very upsetting and, and discouraging uh, for a student or client. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, awesome. Anybody else wanna add to what Kat said there? I might just piggyback on that. Um, that's a good point about, you know, if it if it doesn't work um, and, and there also might be a stigma if a student does have something, you know, something different that another, that, uh, to, you know, other students don't have, um, that they might be embarrassed to use it um, cause I always think about the benefits, you know, oh, it's great, but they might not necessarily think of it the same way, which might create mental health challenges. Yeah. Yeah. I have a funny story of a girl who has, um, she, uh, you know, a talker, but she uses it for many different things and there's games on it too. And her mother uses it to drive her to school because she gets bored and impatient. And sometimes they lose internet connectivity. And the funny thing, is, not funny, it's not funny at all, especially because she tantrums crazy and it's dangerous for the mother to drive. But when they lose internet connectivity and she has a temper tantrum, it never dawned on the mom to say, we don't have internet connection now. It'll come back in five minutes. The mom didn't explain that. Like you were saying, um, you know, uh, so, so actually one intervention was just saying, we have to get through this together, this internet breakdown, and then we'll be good. You know, and that's kind of, uh, you know, kind of she, the mom felt so empowered just by being able to explain that because the kid can hear the kid has autism too, you know, like sort of a high functioning autism, but she has to use that thing on the way to school. And so if there's any internet breakdown, the mom's like, Mom! and, but now really empowered in explaining to her kid, you know, that, that, that this little AT device is going to be working in a few minutes. So another story about 
assistive technology in, in the interplay, I guess you could call it assistive technology, the interplay with mental health is another guy that I have with Usher syndrome who has very significant vision loss, nearly fully blind and um, hard of hearing, but has had to have cochlear implants. And his implants are, he has uh, psychosis. Some people with Usher syndrome actually have psychosis and his onset of psychosis was around in his twenties. He's about maybe 30 now. Um, and at any rate, um, uh, um, his um, ENT doctor was wondering, should we implant him or will that make his psychosis worse? And there's absolutely no data about that. So now it has made him his psychosis really diminish because of the cochlear implant. Like now he's much more aware of things in his environment and not lost in his own head. Like now he can watch the news, he can listen to music. And so he has a much better quality of life because of having that cochlear implant, you know? So, um, you know, I didn't know what was really gonna happen. You know, I didn't have an answer for the ENT person as to how it was gonna go, but it's been a real, a win win for him. Um, he has reluctance to take off as many people do who are blind. And especially if they have hearing impairment too, they become afraid at night or when they're alone, or they need more assistive technology to be alone, especially women um, having a dog or, you know, other things like that to feel safe at nighttime. And for people that have hearing loss, sometimes that have blindness too, they, you know, leave their cochlear, you're supposed to take it off a few hours or at least, and this guy never takes his cochlear implant off and the batteries just die right there on his head. So, you know, um, it's just uh, something to be thinking about of, of how valuable assistive technology can be to someone's mental health. Okay, peer relations. So uh, you guys are, who are working in schools probably want to think a lot about peer relations, not just in name, but actually how to make it happen. Because I guess for people who really have a difficult time getting around, they would have an intervener nowadays in Pennsylvania. They would have an adult who's with them but that also changes the nature of how children view that child and depending on the personality match between that intervener and that child you know that really can have a lot to do with how normative that kids peer relations end up being you know um i have a um adolescent girl who goes to um north hills and um she mentioned she likes her intervener but she always she's like a senior last year and she always um wanted to talk her whole life in her educational career with this one girl's voice who sounded nice to her and she never had the opportunity to be in her proximity she's reflecting on this having been with this other you know this girl for years and never actually made the move you know whether it was anxiety or you know, the intervener never made it happen for her, you know, she was kind of dependent on that. So it's important that, you know, in the IEP, or it, when the parent can talk a little bit with the intervener, or if the kid can be, self, those are teaching self-advocacy, talking a little bit about how to make sure that child is in the proximity of people they like to be with, you know, so that they're not, you know, in the other side of the world from people that they really would like to be with. I got to tell you another story about Jake. So, um, so the other day we had a, uh, at Presley Ridge, um, we had a, a lot of kids get fat on antipsychotic medicines sometimes or medicines for anger and Depakote and things like that. So we wanted to be sure that the kids knew about diabetes and weight gain and that. So we invited an endocrinologist from Children's to come over and they come over with all kind of cool plastic gizmos, you know, broccoli and carrots, um, you know, and um, they have all kind of cool stuff like that for teaching to special needs kids about diabetes and endocrinology and stuff. So Jake, the endocrinologist asked Jake, shows this big picture on the board as to which is better, a bagel or a donut with sprinkles on it. And he couldn't tell the difference because he couldn't see as one was a donut and one was a bagel. And he said um, that the one the, he said the donut that doesn't have sprinkles is what's better for me and so i thought it was a good answer honestly 
But some of the other kid just uh, nastily did, laughed and laughed and laughed at his response. And so, you know, Jake went flying out of the room and, you know, needed all kind of consoling. And the teacher, which I thought was a really nice move, said, just grew him more or less. And how about you help me pass around snacks, you know, just to put him sort of in a role of competence again, you know, um, and I just thought that was a really nice touch for poor little Jake. Um, so sometimes I learn about resources from kids like that girl, um, who went to, um, I think this is, uh, wrong. It should be the athletic thing. Um, you guys probably know about it, but it's called Envision rather than Vision Quest. E-N-V-I-S-I-O-N. It's, um, they have summer camps and they have like sports leagues. I think they have 25 different sports or something like that. I think it's in the North Hills or Cranberry area, something like that. Um, and I think it's local to Pittsburgh, but you know, it's a similar thing, you know, wherever you end up practicing. But the idea is that, you know, it's like baseball with a noise ball or swimming or rock climbing where there's, they're paired with somebody to do these activities, they take volunteers, which are many times teachers of visually impaired or, you know, um, empathetic young people to, to be mentors for, for these kids when they do their sports activities. They do kayaking, paddle boarding, skiing, things like that to, to make these kids have opportunities that are fun for them. And then they also build uh, a network of peer relations and that sort of thing too. So, you know, it kind of seems like a really good organization. I've never volunteered myself, but a couple of people that I know that are adolescents have participated in the sports events. Um, and so, you know, just kind of recognizing the strengths of each kid and sort of perpetuating them, not just focusing only on the pathology, but focusing on skill building as well. Um, you know, what sort of things are they good at? Are they empathetic? Do they like to ride horses? Um, do they want to volunteer at an animal shelter? Do they want to sell Girl Scout cookies? What are they good at? Also, it's important. Uh, this is like, of course, you know this, um, but you know, like there's walks, you know, the, um, the vision walk, um, foundation fighting blindness, um, meeting people who are blind, you know, in, in, it, that's a nice opportunity because it's really well attended those walks. I think it just happened in September. And then conferences are another big place, like there's an Usher syndrome conference or a charge conference. So when people have specific uh, syndromes, there's typically a conference about it, you know, even if it's a, a low incidence kind of thing, there's a conference probably somewhere they meet other kids that have that particular syndrome. Um, so parent listservs, you guys probably know a lot about this too, if you're with um, Department of Education in any kind of way. Um, Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance, you guys know about Yeah. So in Pennsylvania, um, they, um, Patan, um, they have like special interest things about special needs kids, about blind kids, about deaf kids, about deaf blind kids. So it's a, they have a million like in-service trainings. They have a conference. It's a great network. And they also have a network for parents as well. Um, and uh, anybody is eligible for it. There's some other um, connections I put here too. I've gone to some of that Usher Syndrome Coalition. It's really inspiring, um, you know, that there's people from like all over the world that have Usher Syndrome that are there. And if, you know, like if a, if a child has Usher's and they, um, you know, have the means to get to a conference, it's really kind of very, very uh, emotional to see what the other, um, uh, what some of the people have accomplished despite being deafblind and, and really making a difference in the world. So this conference too, for those of you guys who are with um, the Helix conference, which happens in November, um, is put out by Patan. And I think you guys heard Hunter McGowan, his mom is a big part of this conference. Um, and probably she enlisted Hunter to be a help or two um, in it, I don't know, but uh, they're all very passionate, the McGowan family. 
And so that Helix conference is, is a wonderful thing for low incidence, and it probably happens in other states as well, but it's been going on for quite some time, and it's usually in the fall around that same time, and it's held usually somewhere between Penn State and that Lancaster uh, facility usually. It's always listed on the Patan website. So, um, thinking more about those of you who like teenagers, um, some like that one girl that I was talking to, that I was talking about who went to North Hills, who always had wanted to talk to this particular girl and never had the opportunity until her senior year. And by that point, you know, um, it was, you know, probably a little too late that there wasn't any kind of relationship with them and she was graduating from school. But um, her mom had the foresight to, there was a girl in her neighborhood who offered to drive her to school. So instead of having to take the bus with her cane, this girl who had a driver privileges to take go to high school, took this girl uh, from, from North Hills to school every day. And I'm sure she, the, both of them probably felt a little bit awkward because they really didn't know each other much, but they would, you know, talk, like have music playing um, and, you know, just having small conversations. And so some of the things that we talked about in therapy were like, how do you talk to somebody when you really haven't talked to somebody? How do you make small talk? So we would like role play, like how you make small talk, you know, like, wow, it's really cold today. Um, I like your Uggs or, you know, like some of those kind of things that, you know, if you miss visual cues or you haven't had the opportunity to talk to people, you know, and you've always been with somebody or, you know, it's, it's just amazing um, how, how isolating it could be. And, and um, this girl was a relatively sociable person. So now we're going to move into the section about like recognizing mental health symptoms. And this is where you guys who are counselors will have the opportunity to shine, I hope. So we're going to talk particularly about anxiety disorders and mood disorders and probably autism, um, just in intellectual disabilities, probably because those are the ones in trauma, uh, PTSD, that you're going to see the most in adjustment disorders like substance use. That's, you know, there's all these risk factors for blind individuals, the same as hearing. So you should know, those of you who are not mental health counselors, that the incidence of anxiety and depression is about 20% in the general population. So if you also add the fact that you have a sensory disability, you might be behind in school, you have you know, difficulty getting around perhaps, you know, the incidence of having depression and anxiety is much higher. So it's like not necessarily a, a terrible thing, it just, goes with the territory a little bit. So you have to sort of make sure that that doesn't happen as best as you can. And when, if it does, then where to turn, you know, that's the way to think about it. There's another phenomenon, although I haven't seen it in kids. I honestly didn't do a Google search to see if it happens in kids, but I get called a fair amount actually in, in 20, 40 year old people who have um, psychosis um, that's Bonnet syndrome, which they might be sitting there and they see like old people rocking in a chair or some weird phenomena that's very graphic. Um, like, uh, and, and um, it's very disturbing to people until they understand what it is. Not psychosis per se, but a different phenomena that happens to people who have um, visual field blindness. Okay, so you asked, what's an adjustment disorder? Um, so an adjustment disorder is something maybe if the person has, oh, let's call in somebody who has a mental health background. Poor cat. Um, so an adjustment disorder um, is a diagnosis that's usually give, given when, from my understanding, when a client um, is having prolonged difficulty with a life transition. Um, so uh, we can think about it in terms of like general life transitions like, um, you know, retirement or the birth of a child. Um, but then obviously in thinking about disability considerations that can be for 
um, when someone has acquired a disability or is experiencing um, uh, progressive changes in their disability um, and is struggling to cope with those. Mm -hmm. Very well put. It can be too on social factors that happen because of the visual loss, like the child is excluded a little bit more because of peer relations or everybody in the peer group is dating and this person's left out or, you know, there's a lot of ramifications, but there's a stressor and then an emotional response. Awesome. Okay, so what's depression and Victoria? Depression is classified usually by um, a very low sort of like low mood. You're not really able to get out of bed, enjoy life the same way that you used to. Um, and it is based upon um, the duration, frequency, and intensity that you feel it to actually get diagnosed with the depression uh, diagnosis. Very, very accurate, very well put. So um, you guys have probably been screened, all of you, for depression. Like if you go to your primary care doctor, your ob gyn -E person, um, they do this thing called a PHQ-9. And I'm not sure if it'll allow me connect or not. But if I were you, I would probably copy this down you know, and, and just memorize the symptoms. Um, and I'm trying to advance and it's not being nice. There we go. So it's called a PHQ-9 and this is what's used across UPMC, I know. Um, I think in the adult audiology clinic, they now use it too. So you don't have to be a skilled person to recognize depression. But if you're a checklist kind of person until you get used to the language of, of, of asking these questions as Victoria outlined, um, it's okay to like ask people, can you fill this out, you know, or can you tell me a little, just read the symptoms, you know, have you felt this way or how are you coping with this so, and do it all the way through a child's life so that it's like part of like, just as much as you ask about how that cane is going, ask about how their mood's doing, how they're getting around, you know, that sort of thing, normalize a conversation about emotion. All right. So, um, Next, we're going to talk about anxiety and anxiety probably is even more common than depression. And I said 20% of people who have who have normal vision have anxiety and, and depression. But I would imagine even higher among blind individuals, um, just clinically in my experience, but they're also coming to me because they have it. So I have a skewed picture of it, I'm sure. But so anxiety can be there all the time. Like, so people might be not have a good, easy time sleeping because their mind's in overdrive worrying about the next day or how they do, you know, um, does my mom still love me? Um, what if I trip down the steps, you know, um, it can be like an over, you know, rumination all the time of different negative thoughts. And, and usually it's like your self-esteem related is your self-esteem is bombing out and that's why anxiety happens, you know? Um, also it can happen that you have anxiety acutely like a panic attack or all of a sudden or situational. I have a blind lady, she's older, but she can't stand water on her face. And I, she has unilateral blindness and um, a cataract in the other eye. So she doesn't have much vision. Um, and for whatever reason, she, can't stand being in a shower, can't stand when somebody washes her hair and over a sink. And so we have to use like behavioral strategies and actually even medicine to get the lady clean. You know, she's just so hyper aroused by that. And we have to think about a way to make her be able to get clean that doesn't kick up her anxiety. So it's a combination of different things. And it's just crazy how anxious she gets. Um, sometimes people like don't like large crowds or noisy places because they're more dependent than the average person might be on, on noise and signals from the environment coming to them through auditory channels. And if there's all kind of background noise, they miss that. So sometimes there's environmental factors that make a person real nervous that's blind. Oh yeah. Nightness too. Night, nightfall. I have one girl who has glaucoma. Um, she's culturally deaf. And she recently hasn't wanted to do anything at night 
time. She doesn't use a cane either because none of her peers use a cane. Um, but she's very fearful of any activity that past about four o'clock in the afternoon because she's afraid it will be dark when she gets home and won't be able to see, you know. So sometimes those situational kind of things, we're trying to um, work with her on some different strategies for that. This is called a GAD. I'm not sure if I can pull it up or not, but I would also suggest you guys pull that up too. I'll try. Basically it, um, it you know, that, that sense of being keyed up, having a hard time relaxing. Those are symptoms of anxiety that sometimes when you're anxious too, it kicks up stomach acid. So people tend to have more reflux problems. They have a hard time, like even, you know, um, with regular bowel habits, you know, they either have diarrhea or constipation, or they just don't feel right. You know, can't sleep well, um, can't have a conversation that's not about a worrying topic many times. And, you know, it really in, impacts on people's quality of life big time. So um, let's talk about one or two more other things and then we'll um, talk about interventions. Any, anybody? Um, anybody had anything to say on that anxiety? Okay. Um, so how about attention deficit disorder in a blind child? Anybody want to comment on that? So, oh, go ahead. I would imagine that like safety becomes a big issue um, just in uh, or at least it is a consideration, um, just in thinking about a child who, um, would need to have the kind of space to kind of stim and get their energy out and get input from their environment. Um, that if they also, um, had a visual impairment that, um, they may not always be able to tell if where they are is a safe place to move around and, and get that energy out. Mm -hmm. Like you said, taking a break in a safe place, like, you know, um, mental stamina wise, you know? I also just had a conversation today with someone about how a school district is really pushing for a student who has a visual impairment, um, a very slight visual impairment, like it's only on consult for um, the TBI, who is also an o and m and they're pushing for a full o and m evaluation. And she is trying to pre not prevent that, but she is was saying to me her observation so far that isn't that the kid can't see his behavior is just being unsafe because he's you know like all over the place in the hallway so he's bumping into people and so she was to the point where she was trying to explain to the school she doesn't believe it's his vision she thinks it's this other factor that you know he's able to see the people if he was looking but when he's stimming and kind of going back and forth and being wild he's not paying attention so it's not that he can see he can't see is that he's not paying attention to that so I think that can be very complex and if a student already is identified as a student with a visual impairment the school might you know point to the vision and it might be another cause mm -hmm. and that's a, a good way to look at it you know like it takes all kind of brain power looking together in a situation to see what strategy is the best one to intervene on that kid's behalf, you know, is it better that he ambulates in the hall when there's nobody around, you know, um, that would help with whatever his etiology, you know, like whether he had attention deficit disorder or whether he, whatever, you know, like why not, you know, whatever, whatever it, you know, like it doesn't need to be one thing or another, just whatever makes sense. Like you said. Exactly. So I'm like, I definitely think he should have a full assessment. So even if it turns out that it's not his vision, that brings that discussion into the IEP meeting for the whole team to hold. And those IEP meetings are a good opportunity to sort of get feedback from teachers and from everyone about, you know, like that kid, how does he do when actually learning is happening? How is he, 
does he attend, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes or what's his mental stamina like and try to match his mental stamina with how much material is being thrown at him through the course of the day, you know? So like, there's not one strategy necessarily with these kids. Like it, you know, sometimes it's not hardcore attention deficit disorder or, or hardcore O and M, you know, you just have to think about like, okay, what could it be? And how do we intervene on that child's behalf? Because sometimes like you, you can see this Vanderbilt ADHD thing, you can copy those down, you know, print that out if you want to, just to sort of have an idea. But the idea, I'm sure you all know your, your counselors and, and teachers already. So you recognize, um, hey buddy, my dog just came here to visit, um, sorry. And um, so you, you recognize attention deficit disorder, like the distractibility, you know, the difficulty attending to task, um, and, you know, I have a hard time sustaining attention, you know, that's kind of thing. And that's like for all kids with visual, visual loss, you know, it's hard for them to attend to auditory information for a long period of time. Hey, can you sit? So autism spectrum, I think um, anybody want to comment on this because um, in blindness, like if you guys who are in the field want to comment on the crossover between blindness and autism spectrum. I'll just share a, like a thought that I had earlier on. I, I work a lot with people with autism, not so much with people who are blind, but um, just how in autism, that reciprocal social interaction is a challenge and is often a you know, a functional deficit. And that's kind of a function of blindness as well. When we were at the earlier, when you were talking about like babies and young children, not just not having the ability to have that eye contact and that social reciprocal social early um, like uh, experiences. So I just found that interesting. So yeah, the difficulty with communication interaction with people is a diagnostic criteria of autism, but it you know, that is a feature of being blind. So I imagine it might make diagnosis difficult. It definitely does. And uh, I'd like to hear more from people who are teachers too. And then sometimes people are really adamant too. Like when I worked at the School for the Blind, actually, I really liked the behavioralists that I worked with. But some teachers really had a very adamant opinion of that child does not have autism, you know, at a point, does it really matter? Like, you know, like you, you, you really want to work on these skill sets, you know? Um, and, you know, if the kid qualifies, you know, because he has these autistic kind of tendencies, you know, when he turns 21, you'll get a whole lot of money from the state in order to do intervention services. So, you know, like sometimes you have to have these difficult conversations with people, you know, that the reality of how one gets money to help and, you know, like, the power of a diagnosis, um, you know, like um, sometimes you need to put your staunch opinions to rest a little bit and just think about like how to get the kids services, you know, um, but I'd like to hear uh, some uh, teachers that are blind thoughts on that. I can jump in and say um, that from my experience, the student with visual impairments that I worked with did have a lot of autistic tendencies, um, in particular, a lot of uh, behavioral challenges and um, just, you know, social challenges. Um, and I think he was tested numerous times um, and there was never an autism diagnosis, um, but I would agree that there's probably a lot of, a lot of um, similar tendencies um, and similar strategies that could, could work for teaching students with visual impairments. It's, it's a good, um, good idea to have psychologists, you know, like a, a competent psychologist in your, in your repertoire of people that you regularly consult with who are used to working with blind kids. And also like a teacher of the blind who sees many blind kids you know you can tell the difference between one blind child and one, and another when you know the more you're involved in the field now i want to keep in mind too that autism can be very mild dr kretzer had Coulter had um referenced a conference the other day so autistic people can be you know with an iq of 40 who are spinning 
and they can be physicians or rocket scientists at Carnegie Mellon, you know, like, you know, um, there's a whole spectrum, you know, and so you want to kind of keep that in mind, you know, um, but so you might do like a, um, there's several writing scales, um, you know, some psychologists might have you fill out, but you'll see that sometimes when you're working with a child who's blind, this, these writing skills don't exactly fit, you know, with the stereotypies and things like that. Hang on one sec. Hey, can you go? Hey, go find daddy. Sorry, he's not being good. Um, so in essence, you want to ask all along the way about um, things, you know, um, how things are not just about like whatever your field is, like, you know, whether you're doing um, early intervention or whether you're doing Braille or whether you're doing whatever intervention, you know, whether you're talking about transition plan, you become a VR counselor or whatnot. Um, it's important that you, you know, ask about other things in the context of not just um, are you depressed, but just to get a feel for how a child's social and emotional level of functioning, you know, just to sort of assess for some of these issues, talking about goals for the future, or if they have none, you know, to help the child shape them. So, you know, it's sort of, you'll get comfortable, which it, you probably already are if you're in counseling fields, but you'll get comfortable the more you do it, the more you ask about these kind of things, like who's your best friend, you know, or do, do you have any, and maybe they say they have friends, but that they don't really, and ask, you know, what they do with that particular friend. Do they just see them at school? You know, how much time do they actually spend with them outside of school? Or are they in touch with each other texting or not really? Or, you know, um, sometimes kids don't even know really what a friend is, you know, if they haven't experienced it. So that's kind of tough for them. Oh, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight too. So counseling is not just like what happens at Western Psych where you're dealing with, you know, you have a divorce and now you're adjusting to that divorce. It's so many different things when you're counseling with kids who have blindness or visual field deficits or deaf blindness or any of that. You're thinking about all these developmental things. You're thinking about their trajectory for the future, potential risk factors, assistive technology, um, resources like OVR that would be helpful, introducing them you know, to somebody that also has the same sensory disability or can be a role model for them. You're supporting the parent, you know, I think that's what makes it honestly so interesting is, you know, kind of having the opportunity that each case is so different, you know, in, in who you're supporting and what trajectory you're um, encouraging. So where do you refer people? So I don't know if anybody's staying in Pittsburgh or where is everybody going? Whoops. I can speak to um to the pit the layout of services in Pittsburgh, but um if you go to another area, like if anybody goes to Baltimore or Philadelphia area. I don't know how close Delaware is to Philadelphia proper, if it's close. Pretty close. It's pretty close. It's like 45 minutes from Philadelphia, I think. So like CHOP at the Seashore House, they probably have, you know, more more psychiatrists that might be specialized in in in, in kids with autism or, you know, complicated kids who have multiple needs. I know the Lynn Clinic, which is all around the country, but probably mostly in larger cities, is like a team of people that are comprehensive in evaluation. Like maybe they have an audiologist, a speech language pathologist, they have a developmental pediatrician, they have a mental health counselor, they have parent support. So it's kind of that concept. I know there's that also at John Hopkins, you know, so if you are in a big city, you, you might be blessed in having some sort of multidisciplinary team like that to work with your child that you're supporting. Um, and sometimes like a developmental pediatrician, if 
you know, that is a thing in your area. But if you work in Cambria County, you might not have that, you know. Telehealth, I think, is going to change the layout of services. Like, I know we are strongly trying to advocate for, you know, some of these people that have specific skill sets, you know, in developmental pediatrics or in seizure management and this sort of thing. You know, to be able to do that through telehealth is a, is a huge opportunity that I don't think yet we really kind of harness the full potential. Um, but, you know, I know LEND has started doing a lot of telehealth. We do it in psychosis and I do it a lot with deaf individuals. Um, but, you know, what they'll do is they'll have a person come in to the LEND clinic maybe once a year and then they'll have follow-ups where they talk about the genetic findings or the latest in speech language and they'll do that remotely. So it, it has increased the scope of who they can offer services to rather than just being like an Allegheny County, Western Pennsylvania resource since COVID has happened. So the other thing that's important to know about, like if you're worried that kid has intellectual disabilities or autism too, is a psychologist like a PhD person would be able to evaluate that person and see, you know, whether they had learning disabilities, whether they have autism also. And it's also important to get parent input about that kind of stuff because that psychologist doesn't go to the school. Um, they're evaluating that kid in their office. And so a kid can look really different, of course, and you don't have any reference in regards to peer relations or anything. You just kind of get in background history and doing, um, you know, uh, a, a developmental assessment kind of thing. So insurance is sometimes usually like if you're a, a patient at Children's Hospital, if your child is a patient at Children's, there's a neuropsychologist that will evaluate if you're connected to Children's. Um, but you have to be connected to Children's to access their psychologies. Um, there are psychologists also out in the community. Um, and so insurance is kind of iffy on whether they cover. You have to have a good reason. Um, you can also do things like, um, you, you know, like a just a, a specific autism kind of checklist kind of thing if you're trying to get um, specific autism related services. So a psychologist might typically do that kind of thing um, in regards to identifying um, uh, intellectual disabilities and autism. Outpatient counseling would be more LPC, MSW, social workers, different things who would deal like with adjustment related issues. Like if a person is adjusting to the fact that, you know, they're trying to work on peer relations or they're trying to work on, you know, fears about going away to college or where am I going to go? It's an opportunity to talk with someone who's not your mother or your father, but, you know, to sort of offer support to a person and, and outpatient counseling can be very helpful for that kind of thing. So behavioral therapy is more like for the person who has special needs, and typically it's paid for by um, intellectual disability waiver from the Office of Developmental Programs. And that might be like, um, like my lady who doesn't want to take a shower is going to have a behavior specialist who goes into the home and can be mobile in the community and work with her on allaying her anxiety and just, you know, doing a little bit of water from here up or, you know, like kind of working with the group home staff about a, reali a reality-based way to keep good hygiene, you know. So psychiatric services, um, we often, like, are, of course, we're, our role can be about medicines, but um, in both the ways, I both teams that I work, a lot of times, sometimes I'm just a um, analyzing to sort of see what diagnosis fits and that sort of thing. So sometimes the role of a psychiatrist with special needs people is a little bit different than like in a community mental health setting. Um, but so the role of a psychiatrist is typically medication management, but like in, if you're working in a team, you're sort of offering psychiatric input about diagnostic labeling and things like that. Um, and so an inpatient facility might only handle somebody if they're really explosive or if they're hurting someone else or if they're hurting, you know, a danger to self or others, you know, and so there's a pretty high threshold for people going to the inpatient hospital anymore. Um, so there's a, a special needs unit at Western Psych for kids that have intellectual disabilities and autism that have disruptive behaviors. And, you know, Johns Hopkins, likely at CHOP, you know, like bigger hospitals have uh, acute inpatient settings for special needs kids. Most community hospitals don't. 
like Forbes does not, you know, and, and many times they don't even admit kids at all, let alone special needs kids. So, you do, you know, there is limited beds for, for inpatient and it's not necessarily a bad thing because hopefully that's not what we need, you know, um, but sometimes you do. So just as a summary there of all the things that you need to be thinking about. Um, In, in rehabilitation, kind of a mix of rehabilitation as well as counseling um, with the family and with um, the child as well. I'm gonna talk about two cases. I think I sort of talked about one. Oh, not her. And the, I speak about these two um, cases because they're very diverse. So we'll call this girl Brittany and she was like a straight A student um, like had to be, I think in part because of her visual field deficits, she was like, is an overachiever to the nth degree, you know, has to study, never relaxes, never puts her guard down. She's actually involved in that Envision program as well. Um, and, you know, it has to be the best at everything she does, you know, and so, um, in, in, in therapy with her, you know, she knew about, she didn't use a cane. That was something that she would kind of refuse to do. I think she didn't want to be um, viewed as different, you know, like, or whatever, but she uh, many times would uh, use the wall or a friend, you know, but she had strong opinions, very strong willed woman um, about like what she would and wouldn't do. So that's what we talked about really in, in treatment was, you know, like, okay, when, you know, this is good, you know, I don't want you to fall, you know, this is, you know, just to kind of uh, spend time relaxing to going to a jacuzzi, maybe at the, at the JCC, you know, sitting in that jacuzzi once in a while, or, you know, just teaching relaxation strategies to let the guard down, you know, um, that's kind of was the focus of treatment with her. Um, she didn't end, end up being on medicine, but she could have used like a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like a Selexa or something like that, probably. She opted not to do that. You know, we just offer these kind of things, but um, you know, like word, like her parents, I think they were pretty all right people. They were teachers, you know, they, um, but I think she felt in her mind that she had to make A's and she had to, you know, she was the only child that was blind and um, she felt she had to keep up with her siblings. And I mean, they didn't seem like they cared less, you know, but, but um, they were proud of her. Um, but these were the demands that Brittany put on herself, really. She's doing much better. Um, goes to a college. And, and that's another thing when you're working with like transition age kids. There are certain colleges that are more disability friendly than others, like Edinburgh and Slippery Rock. And there, I don't know what it is exactly about those schools. Uh, they probably have, have over time accumulated staff and and um, and and kids that go there. Um, just a much more tolerant and much more accepting environment. Bloomsburg is another one that just come to mind, and you'll learn them too as you get in the community as to what seems to be a good fit for a person. And you don't have to ever suggest this program or that, but you know um, that's what we did um, talking with. Um, um, so um, we'll call this girl Elena. Um, very different kind of case. And she just went left. Um, so she's an 18 year old. She spent some time at the Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children. She's deaf, she has charge, and I'm not sure that you can see the whole slide. Um, but there was always, and this comes up too for kids and for parents, is sometimes there's never the 100% right school for a kid to go to. So she moved from the school for the blind and then they wanted to try to teach her more communication strategies so she ended up going to the school for the deaf and she really liked the school for the blind. So she had a lot more and they moved her around a lot and that was disconcerting to her. So she probably had more behavioral problems in the school for the deaf than she did at the school for the blind. So you, lots of transitions, lots of OCD-ness with her, her charge. 
Um, she's on a lot of medicine. She has a lot of interventions, like she has a behavior specialist. She's connected with the Office of Intellectual Disability. She has kind of autistic traits too. So hers is more like medicine management and behavioral therapy, like not talking therapy. She wouldn't be a person who would go to like an outpatient counselor for talking. You know, she needs specific behavioral strategies to deal with her explosive temper. And then medicines that kind of help her to contain her anger and her OCD tendencies. So that's kind of how it works with special needs kids is it's a, you know, usually a combination of people. So you know, doing their own thing and working. So I think I'm going to stop there because it's almost time to stop anyway. And I don't know if there's time for a question or two. Well, I didn't was... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, ahead. I was going to say, because I didn't cover it. I saw that on the last slide. So sometimes, like if you guys are really into working with blind kids, those of you who are mental health counselors, um, there are many times jobs within the schools too, like at Presley Ridge and at the School for the Blind. You can be implanted in one of those schools, you know, so in addition to the services and the supports that I had suggested, Typically, those special needs schools do have counselors planted within them, and then they can collaborate with outpatient providers as well. But I've neglected to mention that. I was just going to say thank you so much. I know it's getting late, and you know we put these later in the day to accommodate everyone's schedules, but. Um, I think it, that your talk was engaging and interesting and kept, you know, everyone pretty engaged, but it is getting late. So I would understand that people don't have too many questions now, but can I share your contact information yeah, with everyone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you guys so much. Good luck yeah. with your careers. Yeah, I would say Dr. Mathis is a, just a wealth of knowledge and um, so yeah, and just like so well connected in the community is, uh, you know, the deafblind community is a small one, but like the disability community is not. And uh, I've found you to just be just like a wonderful resource and um, know so much about what's going on in the like the disability world of Pittsburgh. It's been, um, it's been great. So I'd encourage oh, everyone else to continue to connect with Dr. Mathis. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. I'm going to